thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and, and thanks to Zurich Instruments for, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the extra minute. Thank you for, to Zurich Instruments for organizing this very nice workshop. I'm looking forward to all the talks. The, the schedule looks, looks very nice indeed. Um, so uh, I guess I can just go forward with this. Yes, so I managed to delete the first slide, which would have told my title, but I guess that's that's okay, because actually the most important thing is here. This is the group uh, that is doing the work. Uh, the title the slide would have told you that I want to talk about uh, imaging of weak magnetic field patterns uh, using, uh, using uh, sensitive scanning probe methods, and that's what I will talk about. And... Um, yeah, so here are the people who actually do the work, as I say, and as I go through the presentation, I will, I will uh, point out the, the members who, who did the, the most work for the particular part that I, that I will be talking about. Um, okay, so let me go forward with an outline. Uh, I'm just gonna start with a little bit of introduction uh, on scanning probe microscopy, especially imaging of, of weak magnetic field patterns. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two particular uh, uh, experiments that we did in our lab recently. So this is very recent uh, unpublished work, uh, one with a, with a squid on tip probe that, uh, that maybe some of you are familiar with, and another one with what we call a, a squid on lever probe, which is our, our, our sort of improved version of that from our, from our own lab. Uh, one of these is on a, a chiral magnet, so a, a bulk magnetic system, and the other one is on a 2D system, a very well-studied system, this uh, chromium germanium telluride. Um, okay, so uh, magnetic imaging. So I don't think I have to uh, Im uh, to uh, motivate imaging so much in this SPM uh, audience, but I, I always like to show this this slide, uh, especially after teaching four years of uh, or maybe five years of uh, physics two, so electromagnetism. Uh, this is uh, an image made with uh, uh, with iron filings in, from the 1800s, uh, showing the magnetic field of a magnet, and it was of course it's a beautiful image, but it was also images like these that really uh, gave the impetus to to the developments that came soon after, so Maxwell's equation and, and the whole revolution that followed. And I think really, you know, magnetic imaging still today is a kind of a driving force in, 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 uh, in driving physics forward and under, driving understanding of what's really happening uh, underneath uh, systems. Uh, and so what I want to, what I hope that I'm showing are images in, in, in this spirit. Uh, and I think what's, what's important to understand about imaging is that unlike bulk measurements where you, you, know, you measure current uh, in transport or magnetic susceptibility, magnetizations, things like this, uh, with images you can really understand things about length scales, uh, inhomogeneity, interactions, defects, all of these that are really, really important uh, for understanding how things really work especially uh, complex things like magnetism, uh, superconductivity, so correlated states where uh, small uh, defects, small uh, changes uh, on, on spatial length scales can, can really uh, be, be important and uh, destroy or, or enhance the system. So, um, right, and what's important uh, in, in modern times is to do this at very high resolution because most interesting things are happening kind of on the nanoscale uh, and to do this very, very sensitively. And why? Well, that's essentially because uh, in the last years, uh, what's been happening with the emergence of, of 2D materials uh, is that we have a whole zoo of new materials with unknown properties uh, that we need to understand. Uh, we need to have scanning probes uh, to measure them. Magnetic scanning probes are really ideal for this because they allow allow us now currents by the measuring of bios of our fields and magnetization also by the measurement of, of stray fields. Uh, and, and they allow us to sort of understand uh, what's going on on a, on a spatial level. But in order to do this, we need to have a very high resolution because these devices typically have small length scales and high sensitivity because these have very small volume. So they have very small magnetization or very small currents uh, flowing through them. Um, so if you're interested in doing this kind of research, so doing scanning probe microscopy that's sensitive and high resolution, then you, you could sort of look at some reviews about scanning probe microscopy uh, of, uh, of magnetic fields, how do you image magnetic systems on, on small and sensitive scales, and you get plots that look like this. So this is out of a review. Uh, in, the, in the review of modern physics. And, and you often see these kinds of plots where you see sensitivity on one axis and size on the other. And, and some people here claim that there's a kind of a fundamental limit shown by this line. But basically, if you want to be sensitive and, uh, and resolution, uh, you need to uh, operate in this, in this area up here, in this corner. Okay, and that sort of limits the kind of techniques essentially to uh, MFM, to scanning squid microscopy and to uh, NV center uh, microscopy. Those are the, the real sensitive and high resolution scanning probes 
where you can uh, where you can investigate things. And so I'm going to tell you about a few of those. I think you're going to hear about all of those in this workshop at some point. I'm going to tell you about actually just the squid ones. We also do a little bit of MFM in our group, and if you're curious about that, we can discuss the, that in the break. Um, okay. So we have a, also I have a review with, with uh, together with Christian Dagen on on on. Uh, which kind of scanning probes uh, from are, are adept for magnetic imaging in, in, in 2D materials, kind of talking in more depth about the things I just introduced. So if you're curious about that, uh, check, this, check this out. Um, all right, so that brings me to the first uh, example that I wanna show you. Uh, this is imaging magnetic configurations at the surface of uh, a material called copper oxoselenide, which I will tell you about before, and you can get these beautiful uh, images like what I'm showing here. This is work done in, uh, in my group by uh, a postdoc, uh, Stephanie Marchiori, who's not here, and another postdoc who is a PhD student in my group, uh, Giulio Romagnoli, who, who may or may not be, <laughs> maybe he's uh, working on the cryostat at the moment. Um, and these are samples that were provided to us via a, a Synergia a collaboration with the EPFL, in particular coming from our Noma Gray, uh, who grows these very nice crystals at the EPFL. So what is this system? So maybe not all of you are familiar with this, uh, this material. It's an insulator. It's a chiral magnet that hosts very interesting uh, magnetic states that are modulated in space on the nanometer scale. Uh, and it's, a, it's essentially a bulk crystal. Typically, these kinds of materials have phase diagrams that look like this. So here we have the magnetic field and the temperature, and they host these different kinds of magnetic phases. So a very simple field polarized phase here, where you just have everything polarized along a direction, and then more complex uh, non-collinear phases down here. So conical phases and helical phases, where the magnetization is, is going around in a certain axis. And then sometimes they also host these very interesting, perhaps technologically useful objects uh, like skirmions, which are essentially like little vortexes or vortex tubes. Um, so this is not a, a, a new material. It's been investigated uh, also by, by, uh, by imaging techniques, um, especially this high temperature skirmion phase. Uh, and it's invest been investigated by bulk measurements where you can measure magnetization or you can do neutron scattering and learn about the overall behavior of the material. Also imaging like Lorentz TEM, uh, where you actually have to cut the sample into little slices and, and you change its properties quite a bit. Uh, but there hasn't been too much work done in terms of uh, scanning at the surface of the material and seeing what what is what are the magnetic states at the at the surface, which may be the most uh, technologically relevant. There has been uh, some MFM done on this material, but it's a little bit difficult for MFM because MFM produces quite large local fields that actually can, can change the state and be rather invasive. So uh, our idea, uh, our goal here was really to apply scanning squid microscopy, which is a, a very non-invasive uh, magnetic uh, scanning probe uh, to image the low temperature skirmion phase, which is a, a kind of a relatively newly discovered phase in this material. Uh, and to see this with 100 nanometer resolution because the modulation should be on the order of 50 to 100 nanometers. Uh, and then to try to see what happens as we change phases, what do the phase transitions look like? What is the role of defects? Um, how does this look uh, on the spatial, from the spatial point of view? And also to see if things that uh, happen at the surface are different from what happened at the bulk, because in principle at the surface, you have a, you have a, a change in the symmetry, which can strongly affect the stability of a magnetic uh, phase. Okay, so for this, we used uh, our scanning squids. These are things that we make in our own lab. Uh, hopefully most of you are familiar with a squid. So this is, a, it's, a, it's a super conducting loop with two weak links. Uh, and uh, uh, basically the interference uh, uh, of these two weak links produces a, a sensor that is very, very sensitive to the flux threading through that loop. Uh, and so you can produce a very, very sensitive magnetic field uh, sensor. The challenge in making this into a scanning probe is to make this, scan, this squid loop very, very small and to put it on a tip. And so we do that via a method invented by the, the Zeldoff group at, at, at the Weizmann Institute. And then we, we modified this a little bit. Uh, we essentially produce little squids on these little glass capillaries on the end. Uh, I, I don't really have time to get into the, the details of this here, but if you're curious about that, you can, you can ask me about that. And we also have some experts here, uh, Denis Vazyukov, who was giving one of the later talks, is heavily involved in developing this. Um, so, okay, the properties of these things, these are, oops, can I go back? Yes. these are very, very sensitive and on the order of about 100 nanometers, giving that kind of resolution. Uh, and then we put this in our, in our cryogenic scanning probe microscope and we essentially just scan the tip over the sample. Okay, and the sample is just a big piece of bulk crystal, which you can see here. 
um, with a flat, a flat area on which we scan. And uh, essentially the area we're interested in, I need to get better at this, um, is, is, to, uh, is right around here where we should have some kind of helical phases, conical phases, and perhaps also some skirmion phases. Just going to walk you through uh, some of the phase, uh, phases that we see by just going through, going from high field where we've saturated the magnet into a field polarized state, and we're going to reduce the field through zero and then go into the reverse field. And you're going to see a whole zoo of, of, uh, of different images that correspond to, to different uh, magnetic phases. So this is the simplest one you can see here. This is the field polarized phase. Uh, we're at relatively high field for this material. And this is an image of the magnetic field basically out of the plane of this, of this sample. Uh, at the surface. And on the uh, other side, we have here a, an image which is just the derivative of that magnetic field uh, uh, in the plane because we shake our tip and we can look at the derivative. This is very useful for seeing things in higher resolution. It allows you to get rid of some, some drift noise and to see things that are, that are very, very small. Right now you see nothing, which is what we expect, right? The magnetic field is basically all pointing up. Now we reduce the field and we suddenly, we start to see some, some things entering here. And we basically, as we reduce the field millitesla by millitesla, you really see these, these things developing. These are essentially domains of a new phase entering into the field polarized phase. Um, and, and you can see the, the structure here is really quite incredible. Uh, you see lots of, uh, if you look very carefully here, these are sinusoidal patterns. Uh, up and down in magnetic field, uh, kind of little stripes that are slowly starting to populate uh, this, the, the entire area and fill up uh, the, the, what was formerly a field polarized phase until you have an entirely uh, uh, sinusoidal uh, modulation throughout the entire sample. Okay, and this is a very large area. You can see it's on the order of, of 10 by 5 microns or something like that. Um, and in fact, I, I'll tell you what this is, but if you reduce the field, what happens is you keep seeing this, uh, this modulation and the period starts to get longer and longer. Okay, and so what is that? Uh, you can understand this relatively simply. Uh, basically, we have uh, what's, what's called a, a conical or helical phase where you have uh, the magnetization essentially rotating around some propagation direction uh, like this. Uh, and you get different planes of magnetization perpendicular to that prop propagation direction. And what we have uh, from, we know from bulk measurements, what we should have in that field range is a tilted conical phase. So basically a phase where the propagation direction is tilted away from the normal. And so at the surface, you get these kind of, uh, this projection of the magnetization that's uh, oscillating up and down, up and down. And we see the corresponding oscillation in magnetic field. So what you would see at the surface, let's say if the helical phase was aligned uh, perpendicular to the surface would be nothing. And then as you tilt away, you start to see this, uh, this, these, these modulations. So by counting the modulations, we can, we can tell the, uh, the angle of this tilted conical phase. Uh, and that's something that we can compare with, with bulk neutron scattering measurements to see if what we measure makes sense. So this is a fit of, our, of, our, uh, of the angle that we get from our modulation frequency. Uh, and we compare this to previous measurements done by the Flyderer group with neutron scattering, and we see very good match. So depending on how you uh, cool the system down, whether you do zero field cooling or high field cooling, you get slightly different behavior and we can reproduce all of that. So we're quite confident that what we're seeing here is, is really the same state that they see in the bulk, just projected onto the surface. Um, Funnily, what happens as you reduce the field below about 80 millitesla is that the system looks quite different. So this nice sinusoidal uh, oscillation goes away and you start to see something more complex and the, and the period gets very, very long. And uh, basically uh, you can see it, it persists to very low field, even down to zero field. You see these kind of stripe-like structures like this. And even as you cross zero and go into reverse field, you still see these structures around. Now, this is nothing that, that is predicted by the, by the bulk measurements here. You should be in a, in a helical state aligned along the propagation, aligned perpendicular to the surface, and you should essentially see nothing. Um, so this is very intriguing, and, and we've started to do some modeling, which I, I can't show you here, but, uh, but basically we think that this is a surface state. So something which is confined to the few first uh, few, maybe 100 nanometers of the surface, and really has to do with the fact that the surface breaks the, the symmetry of the system. So as we go into, into higher reverse field, then what happens is eventually the system uh, is, is not, no longer favorable. Sorry, this phase is no longer favorable and we get back into the conical phase on the other side. So you see this very nice uh, uh, sinusoidal uh, uh, oscillation again. And then of course, as we go to even higher field, it starts to break up into domains of the field polarized state, right? We still we get back into polarization. We see this thing breaking up and something very interesting happens. If you look very closely uh, here, you start to see little dots in here. So I think this will be more clear here. 
lots of little dots uh, all over the place. And this is a very interesting image because you seem to have tilted conical phase, field polarized phase, and then these dots, which are actually skirmions. Okay, so they're skirmionic tubes that thread through the sample. And as you increase the, uh, the, the field, then you get only skirmions. And they, uh, what's very interesting about them is that they're, they're completely disordered. So if you do a Fourier transform, you get this blob. So you see no, no kind of uh, uh, length scale that dominates, no kind of orientational order, which is very unlike what people measure in, in, in neutron scattering. They, they tend to see uh, skirmion lattices. And we're still trying to understand why that is. Uh, it's probably having to do with defects at the surface and, and pinning. Um, and okay, as you go to a higher and higher field, then these things uh, go away. So I have limited time. So actually, that's all I'm going to say about that material. But of course, you can ask me about this more. But as you can see, there's a lot you can learn uh, about measuring uh, by measuring at the surface with these kinds of sensitive probes. Uh, and I think we're really in the beginnings of understanding uh, how that's different from what happens in the, in the bulk. Um, I want to tell you quickly, I hope I still have a bit of time. Um, how much time do I have left, actually? 15 minutes, excellent, good. So then I want to go on to a, a two-dimensional system called a chromium geranium telluride. Um, this is a, a very famous uh, 2D magnet that I will introduce a little bit better, uh, and where we also made images using a scanning squid uh, technique. So this is work done also by a postdoc, uh, Kosik Bagani in our group, uh, and, and uh, two PhDs, uh, Andriani Fevrelaki and, and uh, Daniel Yeter. Uh, and this is in collaboration with uh, some uh, uh, researchers in Denmark at the DTU who provided us with these, uh, with these samples. All right, so the, the measurements that I showed you before were done with a scanning squid on tip. And uh, essentially the way that works is you have a very, very sharp glass needle with some superconducting material sputtered on top. Uh, and we, uh, we couple this somehow to a tuning fork in order to try to not crash this thing on the surface as we scan. I think all of you who are doing scanning probe know about touching the surface and crashing and how difficult that can be. It's especially difficult when you're making these very fragile superconducting probes that you make every time yourself in the lab, uh, because every time you touch the surface, they break and you have to start the whole thing over again. So this, this kind of, uh, uh, kind of quasi AFM or this kind of uh, understanding of where you are in the sample and how far you're from the surface is really, really crucial. And it's particularly difficult in, in, in this configuration. So you have a very, very stiff uh, uh, tuning fork, which is intended for, you know, uh, doing uh, AFM at very, very short length scales on the order of uh, a few nanometers uh, 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 attached to this very fragile thing, which is kind of on the order of 100 nanometers. Uh, so in, in general, we, this kind of works, but you, you know, if you look at the frequency shift of this tuning fork as a function of the tip sample distance, you can see that nothing really happens until you're about 20 nanometers away, which if you have a 100 nanometer diameter probe, in some cases can be too late. Um, it's, you're almost already touching or, or in contact or breaking. Uh, so for, for many years, we struggled with this um, and we, we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could just put this damn uh, squid on a cantilever and use it as an AFM? Uh, and then we could have, you know, just use a commercial controller and do AFM and know where we are and not worry about crashing and have, and have also a nice squid. And so we, we spent some time uh, in the group trying to develop that, uh, basically making an AFM, which has the kind of uh, nano squid that I showed before on its tip. Um, and so I want to walk you through that before I, I show you its application. And the, the idea there and what we end up with in the end is something where we, which we can control much better. So you see here again, tip sample distance and frequency shift of our AFM lever. And this is very typical for a non-contact AFM lever. You can get hundreds of, of hertz of frequency shift for just uh, so even uh, uh, fractions of a micron away. And that means that you can stabilize uh, at a constant distance. That means you can avoid uh, crashing. That means you can control the system much better and also image uh, using topography uh, at the same time that you, you image with your squid. So what did we do? How did we do this? We took a, uh, a commercial AFM lever and we took it to our favorite expensive device, which is the focused ion beam. Uh, and we, we just chopped it off. We machined it uh, to make a little... Uh, a little uh, plateau there. Then we take it to our collaborators in the Schoenenberger group who have a very nice sputtering system, sputtering very good niobium uh, superconductor. And we sputter niobium over the, the whole side of this thing. And then we go back to our favorite uh, 
expensive device and cut with the fib uh, uh, some trenches, uh, basically areas which should break the superconductivity so that we have essentially uh, two leads, two superconducting leads here. And if you look very carefully here, a hole uh, with two little gaps here so that we have a squid with two weak links. Uh, uh, and this is actually what that looks like in, in one of the early, uh, early versions. Uh, this is the, 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 the niobium on the cantilever and the fib cuts. And if you look very carefully at the tip, this is the kind of tip that we produce. So you see this loop here, uh, you see these, and these two little constrictions, which provide the, the Josephson junctions. And at that time, we also included a little, a little protrusion here, which provides a kind of a AFM tip to give us a reasonable resolution AFM at the same time. Turns out that's not so necessary. There are ways around this now, uh, but if you're curious about that, we can, we can discuss later. So using this device, then we have basically an AFM, which we can control with just a regular AFM controller. Uh, we can do uh, AFM as, as you normally do it. And at the same time, we can measure magnetic field or magnetic flux via the squid. Now this realization, you can see it's not particularly small. The loop is on the order, the physical loop is on the order of 200 nanometers. And then the actual loop because of the damage from the focused ion beam is on the order of three or 350 nanometers. But these days we can get this down to about 150 nanometers or so. Uh, so this, this is what this, the, the, the transport properties of the squid looks like. So the important plot is basically here. You can see that there's some current in the squid that is modulated as a function of the applied magnetic field. And you can basically count the number of flux quanta here. And that tells you something about the diameter of the device. And from the slopes, you can also figure out what the sensitivity of the device is. And it's, so it's a, it's a reasonably sensitive device, um, both to temperature uh, which I could discuss later, but most importantly to magnetic flux or magnetic field. Uh, okay. So we, we first did some calibration measurements with this kind of uh, sensor. So we just measured it like a typical AFM. We do this, we measure the dis deflection optically, uh, but in principle, that's, that's not, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, and we measured a, a kind of a magnetic array. This is an array of uh, artificial spin ice, some little thin cobalt magnets. And what we wanted to see was, can we measure the topography and the magnetic uh, stray field at the same time? So this is the topography that we measure via AFM. And you can see nice, relatively high resolution AFM and also a kind of a, a shadow coming from the large kind of uh, triangular tip size as well, uh, but you can clearly see that we can navigate around the sample, and then we can also measure the uh, the stray magnetic field. So this is a real measurement of the stray magnetic field of that sample, and if you compare that to the model, that's sort of exactly what you would expect in, in the particular field state that we put it in. Uh, so here you can overlay what, what the how these these magnets are pointing. The, you can see there's two magnetic defects there, which some people call monopoles, but I think. They're just flip spins of the magnets. <clears throat> um, okay, so that was just to show you that we have a nice working sensor. Now I, I want to show you the application of this to this very interesting 2D magnet. So this is a, a 2D Heisenberg ferromagnet with a TC of around 30 Kelvin. Uh, it's, it's been studied quite a lot. I think it was the first one to be imaged via uh, uh, magneto-optical uh, microscopy. Um, it's a soft ferromagnet with an out of magnet easy axis. axis. And it can also, its magnetic order can be controlled by, by, by gate voltages by changing the, the carrier density. So we wanted to see if using our, our, our nice sensor, we could learn something new about the system. Uh, can we really see the evolution of its magnetization as a function of thickness, but also as a function uh, of applied uh, field? As I didn't mention, but these, these uh, scanning squids that we make, because of the kinds of Josephson junctions that we use, they can uh, support relatively high magnetic fields, uh, in some cases up to a few Tesla. Uh, the, the scanning squid on lever that I'm showing you goes up to about half a Tesla or, or almost a Tesla. And that's quite unique for, for scanning squids. Um, okay, so we have this flake here. You see this op optical uh, image of a flake uh, with some uh, uh, HBN encapsulating it. And you can see it has various layers. And we take an AFM of that using our, our scanning squid on lever. And so that we can essentially count how many, uh, roughly how many layers we have underneath the tip. Uh, and at the same time, we can make an image of the uh, Magnetic field in the Z direction. Now this is uh, at, at a relatively large applied magnetic field of 144 millitesla out of, out of plane. So the system is essentially saturated and you can see uh, this, this red, uh, the field showing the, the saturation. This is the DB Z DZ signal, which is, it gives you a little bit higher spatial resolution and sensitivity, which essentially comes from uh, taking, uh, using the lock-in, the Zurich lock-in to measure the, the AC magnetic field as you shake the cantilever on resonance up and down. Okay, so it gives you a derivative of the field in that direction. 
Uh, and then using some uh, reconstruction techniques, actually with some help from the Malatinsky group who developed some of this, uh, we, 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 uh, we can get magnetism uh, uh, in, in Z uh, from the, from the stray field. Um, okay, and so this shows some magnetic field dependence of that particular flake. So we can basically make the images. I think these are, just to be clear, uh, images of the dvdz uh, signal, this one here, which is the, the most sensitive, as a function of the applied magnetic field. So we go from a high negative field down towards zero, and you can see, start to see domains forming and different parts of the sample flipping, depending on the layer thickness. Uh, here you can see an extreme case of the domains uh, right after uh, crossing zero, and then you can see saturation in the other direction. Okay, so we were very interested in studying this in more detail, and in particular to relating what we see with how many layers we have. And so here you have essentially some regions where we use the AFM to count how thick uh, the layers are, and we then uh, integrate our magnetic signal inside these regions and plot it, and we can see that we get different kind of magnetic behavior for each region of the sample, depending on the layer. Uh, how many layers are there. Um, so we try to do this a little more carefully in a different part of the sample. So this is a different region of the sample. Here's an optical image where you can nicely see the layers. And this is the corresponding AFM uh, from, our, uh, from our, um, our squid on lever. Uh, and from the, actually from the cross section of that AFM, you can really count how many layers uh, the steps correspond to. Uh, and then we did the same thing on this. So we did an out of plane field sweep. And again, you can see here uh, the saturated magnet it's going down, domains are forming, particularly in this thick part of the sample first, uh, uh, things are flipping, it's uh, saturated in the other direction down here, and then we go back in and rear back all the way to the, to the initial field again. Uh, so you can really see, we can, we can drive the system all the way through reversal and really look uh, carefully at, at images on, on the way. And so here is a more careful analysis where we, we look at say a couple of very thick regions where we have on the order of 15 layers, and integrate uh, the magnetic signal and get out a hysteresis. Uh, and then we look at some of the thinner areas and we can see a very distinct difference. So uh, we can see different saturation fields, of course, because there's a certain amount of magnetization per layer and we can see different coercivities and, and, and different uh, yeah, properties of that. So I, uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little bit faster here. Uh, here uh, we, have, uh, an, we apply an in-plane field and we can also measure the reversal as we go through the in-plane field. So uh, sort of as the final thing that I want to say about this, uh, you can essentially relate the number of layers to the magnetization we measure, and then we can attract, we can extract a magnetization per layer, which is uh, very well in line with what's been measured with other, with other techniques, uh, which ultimately falls down to something like 2.1 or 2.2 uh, Bohr magnetons uh, uh, per chromium map, which is, which is in, in line with what you see in other measurements. Um, we did some modeling on this, which I am afraid I'm going to have to skip. Uh, but what, what I can tell you about this is that with some uh, very simple micromagnetic modeling, we can see that what we measure actually very much corresponds to, the, to these kinds of, so when, when you see these domains, it very much corresponds to states that look like this, with, uh, which we can describe by just putting in uh, the properties of this uh, magnetic system. And we're starting to learn that there are some layer dependent effects now that we get into the details of the modeling, uh, but it's, it's early days, so I'm going to have to tell you about that at, at some later, later talks. Uh, okay, so with that, I will skip ahead. I, I've probably been too optimistic about how much I could say. I will flash the results here um, that we see uh, layer dependent uh, effects and that we, we can measure the saturation magnetization per, per layer. Uh, and I'm gonna flash up some uh, references. If you're interested in any of this, please have a look at these or just talk to me uh, after the break and uh, enjoy the rest of the workshop. Thank you.